RT presses the US State Department for proof of claims Russia's been targeting hospitals in Syria. But the response was far from expected. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to put Russia today on the same level with the rest of you who are well, representing you independent well, media well, well, Hold on. And she's a journalist, just like the rest of us are, so it's, you know, it's, she's asking pointed questions, but they're, they're not, you know. From a state-owned, from a state-owned, they're, they're from a state-owned outlet, but they're not, from a state-owned outlet, it's not The questions that she's asking are not out of line. Barack Obama's in Berlin to bid goodbye to his, quote, closest international partner, Angela Merkel, as a part of his farewell European tour. The so-called Snoopers Charter is given the green light in the UK, effectively allowing the security services to spy on citizens. Your source for worldwide news headlines 24 hours a day. It's RT International. Thanks for joining us. The U.S. State Department says RT will no longer be treated on a par with other news outlets. It comes after we repeatedly asked for evidence to back up the department's allegations that Russia's hit numerous hospitals and airstrikes in Syria. It also claims Moscow's blocked humanitarian aid from reaching conflict zones. Our Washington correspondent, Guyan A. Chichikan, gave us her first-hand account of that briefing. It took some pressing an effort to get specifics. Uh, as you know, uh, State Department's John Kirby has accused Russia of hitting five hospitals in Syria within the past few days. When asked by another journalist in which cities, Mr. Kirby did not seem to know or think it was necessary to share such specifics. I followed up on my colleague's question here. Don't you think it is important to give a specific list of hospitals that you're accusing Russia of hitting? Those are grave accusations. I'm not making those accusations. I'm telling you we've seen reports from credible aid organizations that five hospitals and a clinic, Which at least one in clinic. Which cities, at least? You, you can go look at the, the information that many of the Syrian relief agencies are putting out there publicly. Uh, we're getting our information from them, too. These but reports, you're citing those reports without giving any specifics. Because we believe these agencies uh, are, are credible and because we have other sources of information that back up what we're seeing from well, some of these from some of these reports and you know what why don't you ask well, here's a good exactly. question why don't that's you ask I, your defense ministry that's what, I what they're doing if and, you give and a see specific if you can list, get no 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 if you no, give no, a specific no. list of hospitals no 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 my, my colleagues who are I'm listening to, hopefully would be able to go and ask russian officials about a specific list of hospitals that you, you work, work for russia, russia today right isn't that, that your is agency correct. and so yes. why shouldn't you ask your government the same kinds of questions that you're standing here asking me. Ask them them. about their military activities. Get them to tell you what, or when to I deny ask what they're specifics, doing. When I it seems your response is, why are you here? Well, you are leveling that accusation. No, and if you give specifics, no, my colleagues would be able no, to ma'am. ask Russian Once officials. Once again, you're just wrong. I'm not leveling those accusations. Relief agencies that we find credible are leveling those accusations. Furthermore, Mr. Kirby made it clear, had the questions come from somebody else, another journalist, somebody not working for RT, he would have answered differently. Be careful about saying your defense minister and things like that. I mean, she's a journalist just like the rest of us are, so it's, you know, she's asking pointed questions, but they're, they're not, you know. From a state-owned, from a state-owned, they're, they're from a state-owned outlet, but they're not, from a state-owned outlet. The questions that she's asking are not out the of outlet. line. I didn't say the questions were out of line. Okay. I didn't I mean, say the questions were out of right. line. Okay, okay? But, but I'm, I'm not. Oh, no, I understand. I'm but sorry, asking, but I'm not going to put Russia today on the same level with the rest of you who are well, representing you have an independent well, media outlets. Well, hold on, but, but, but just, but, look, there, well, let, we'll talk about, we can talk about this a, later, on, later, on. later offline, but um, just, you know, the question is not an inappropriate question to ask. Mm didn't say that it was, but I also think it should be asked of their own defense ministry, okay. which they don't do, which Russia today doesn't do. As I was walking out of the briefing room, an official from the State Department's press relations office caught up with me, said, I'm sorry about that, and asked for my email to send the list of hospitals. I received that list. It mentions five hospitals reportedly hit by airstrikes, among them three hospitals in Atareb, in western rural Aleppo, and two others in Syria's Idlib province, in the towns of Benish and Marat Anuman. 
The State Department official cited the World Health Organization as the source. Upon receiving the email, we saw a press release put out by the WHO this Wednesday saying five hospitals were attacked. The statement does not attribute blame. We cannot independently verify the reports at this time. I know my colleagues at RT in Moscow are planning to ask the Russian Foreign Ministry about these specific accusations this Thursday. The Russian embassy in the U.S. has reacted to the incident at the briefing. It said such behavior from the Washington official only shows the State Department has no evidence to prove its allegations. Earlier, we heard from two former U.S. diplomats. Here's what they had to say. Uh, watching Admiral Kirby uh, performance and behavior, shameful, reprehensible, despicable. I mean, he, he, he really is an embarrassment uh, to be in the position that he is and to have conducted himself that way. It is so unprofessional, and it's, it borders on incompetence. I thought it was interesting he faulted RT for being uh, state-supported, and then he immediately turned to, now let's hear from the BBC. I, I guess there is very much a double standard. On, on the substance of Aleppo, you know, here we have a Russian-supported Syrian offensive against Al-Qaeda in Aleppo, which is strikingly similar to what is going on with the U.S. support for the Iraqi offensive against uh, ISIS in, in Mosul. There's all sorts of understanding. In the case of Mosul, you're hit, you're, 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 you have an offensive against a populated area held by a vicious terrorist group. No understanding of that situation when it comes to Aleppo, just unsupported accusations and not even identifying the sources of the accusation. It's hard to believe that this is being done in good faith. Well, Moscow says it's wiped out a large group of al-Nusra militants in the province of Idlib. According to the defense ministry, 30 terrorists were killed, including three commanders from the al-Qaeda affiliate. They were hit by strikes launched from the aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. On Tuesday, the flagship of the Russian fleet took part in large-scale combat operations for the first time in its history. It's helping to target terrorists in the provinces of Idlib, here, and Homs as well. But this offensive does not affect Moscow's continuing ceasefire over Aleppo, where al-Nusra militants still control large parts of that area. Now, there have been no strikes on Aleppo by Russian air forces for exactly one month now. However, the city has been engulfed in violence, with rebels unleashing a series of what the UN's branded indiscriminate attacks on civilians. And with no day going by without the interruption of gunfire or explosions, many children living in Aleppo have been robbed of their childhoods. But now a special shelter has been set up to offer relief from the horrors of war and allow kids to simply be kids. Murat Gazdiev reports. This is not a common sight in Aleppo. Singing and dancing in a dark alleyway at night. This is Aleppo war therapy. So this is all well and good, really fun, you know, dancing, singing, coloring things in. But ultimately, you might ask, what's the point? of the bombing and everything is happening in Aleppo. At least when, when they come here, they feel safe and uh, they enjoy their, their time in, like, in these two hours. This is the point and when we see that the smile in the, of the children on their faces, we feel so alive. For these children, gunfire and blasts are part of daily life. Some of them haven't lived a day without an explosion within hearing distance. <laughs> And many of them have been psychologically scarred. These children have been deprived of a normal childhood. And for a few hours a day, this center provides some much needed respite from the terror of war. It's all organized by a Christian Orthodox charity in Aleppo with the help of churches from around the world. Every day, hundreds come to the church for help, Aleppo's most desperate. <laughs> And it's open to all, not just Christians. 
جاي مشان معونة عند الأولاد عندي طفل عمره ستة شهور وأبني كمان هذا الثاني عمره أربع سنين لا نحن كلياتنا أخوة وأهل إن شاء الله الله يسلمك الله يسلمك من السلام Nobody has turned away, whether it's diapers, medicine, free laundry, or even jobs. The charity has helped more than a quarter of a million people over the last year. Unfortunately, doing good deeds doesn't make you immune to the civil war. These two church buses were shredded by a rebel shell, and that's unfortunate for three reasons. Sanctions, the civil war, and scarcity make them all but irreplaceable. The problem is mostly political. Western sanctions target more than Assad. They prohibit all trade and almost all interaction with Syria. العقوبات ساهمت بعدم قدرتنا على ترميمة لهاي المعامل، بعدم القدرة على جيب أي مادة أولية من من الخارج. ساهمت ب ب. What can be made in Syria is made in Syria. What can be smuggled in is smuggled in. And whoever they can help, they help. Morad Gazdiev, RT, in Aleppo. Barack Obama has arrived in Berlin to meet who he called his, quote, closest international partner, Angela Merkel. As part of the outgoing president's farewell tour of Europe, just weeks before he hands the keys to the White House to Donald Trump. RT's Peter Oliver has more now on the future of U.S. relations with the EU. This was set to be something of a victory lap around Europe for Barack Obama. However, the results of last week's U.S. election have changed the tone somewhat. He was in Greece on Wednesday and he seemed to have to um, be really trying to reassure people that not too much would change. Well, what that reassurance didn't help was the riots that he was greeted with. Some really unsavory scenes on the streets of Athens. People shouting, Yankee, go home at the U.S. president. Molotov cocktails thrown and uh, riot police attacked with baton. Well, a very different reception for Barack Obama here in Berlin. Germany is, of course, one of the U.S.'s closest allies. And in Angela Merkel, the German chancellor has been one of the closest partners of the U.S. president. Certainly over the eight years that Mr. Obama's been in the White House, Angela Merkel has been a, a rock of stability. Barack Obama, throughout his time in the White House, has been full of praise for Chancellor Merkel. My close friend and partner, Chancellor Angela Merkel. My closest international partner these past eight years. Chancellor Merkel is a great friend and a great ally. Well, Barack Obama also talked about Angela Merkel being the one to pick up the baton of global liberal leadership. Of course, Angela Merkel has an all-important election to fight in 2017, and that type of internationalism would not be too popular with a large selection of the electorate here. What she has to look forward to is what comes next. And dealing with Donald Trump will most likely be very different to uh, how she's dealt with Barack Obama. But one thing that we have seen, one thing that probably brought, brought about the election of Donald Trump is a failure of some of that liberal leadership to convince voters. And we are seeing signs of that as well here in Germany. Angela Merkel's popularity hit a five-year low uh, earlier on in 2016. We've also seen anti-establishment political parties on the rise. They've made gains in local elections and have their eyes firmly set on next year's general election. Now, speaking to some people here on the streets of Berlin, many aren't too impressed by the legacy that Barack Obama will leave and also not too keen on looking forward to Angela Merkel picking up that baton. Yeah, that's a disaster for us. This will be a disaster for us. Just look around what she has done here. She destroyed our relations with Russia. She let in over a million and a half people against our existing laws. She broke the law, and not just a bit. She let over a million in without asking the population. There are too many refugees. Germany can't take any more. Therefore, something has to change. She should go. It is time for Merkel to be voted out. People are very unhappy. They are unhappy with various policies, family policies, refugee policies, unemployment. People are not being listened to. They live in a bubble. They have no connection to the people. This situation has nothing to do with democracy. I hope that in 2017 she will be voted out. 
Barack Obama's last foreign tour comes as Donald Trump's expected victory threatens to, uh, well, uh, fuel popular electoral revolts across Russia. I should say the unexpected uh, victory, excuse me. We have spoken to several experts here on the channel. They believe that Europe's establishment now needs to watch its back. I believe that Donald Trump will do just as well to take on board someone like Nigel Farage to um, help him steer his way to the European economy and have Britain leave the European Union but still continue to trade. Now, all the other EU leaders are coming on board, the likes of um, Gert Wilders, Marine Le Pen, they have something to actually go for. Real people say, actually, you know what, I'm worried about immigration. Um, you know what, I'm worried about the impact on the economy of what's going on in my country. Is not racist, it's not xenophobic. And the voters of outside uh, the Washington Beltway that you referred to, you know, they're sick to death of being talked down to. And the same thing happens here in Britain. People who live outside Westminster, who are not part of this cosy liberal elite, say, I am sick and nobody listening to me. What's really happened in the U.S. is the same that's happening over there in Italy with the populist movement, with the Five Star movement, with Le Pen's movement in France, with with the AFD party in Germany, with the Freedom Party in Austria. What it is, it's an anti-elite movement. Meanwhile, European countries need to start thinking of their own nuclear security plans following Trump's victory. That's according to a senior German lawmaker. And the words come despite Barack Obama trying to reassure the continent of Trump's commitment to both NATO and Europe. Artis Caleb Mopan reports. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has long been an almost unquestioned aspect of U.S. foreign policy. The new president-elect, Donald Trump, has indicated that this could soon change. Either they pay up, including for past deficiencies, or they have to get out. And if it breaks up NATO, it breaks up NATO. During the campaign season, Donald Trump played down Washington's need to serve as the world's peacekeeper, instead focusing on domestic issues. So you're really suggesting the United States should decrease its role in NATO? Not decrease its role, but certainly decrease the kind of spending. We are spending a tremendous amount in NATO and other people proportionately less. No good. But the kind of money, look, we owe $19 trillion. We can't afford to do all of this anymore. NATO has set a defense spending target for its member states at 2% GDP. Only four NATO members actually pay this amount. Meanwhile, the United States pays 3.5% of its GDP on defense with the largest military budget on Earth. The message of Trump's campaign has been no more freeloading. I haven't given lots of thought to NATO, but two things. Number one, the 28 countries of NATO, many of them aren't paying their fair share. They do not focus on terror. While Obama has been reassuring his European allies that Donald Trump is committed to protecting Europe. Uh, he uh, expressed a, a great interest in uh, maintaining our core strategic relationships. Uh, and so one of the messages I will be able to deliver is his commitment to NATO. They simply don't seem convinced, leaving those across the Atlantic fearing another period of U.S. isolationism. It's true the election of Donald Trump risks upsetting the balance between the two continents. The transatlantic alliance and NATO alliance is called into question. I think we have to prepare for the fact that American foreign policy will be less predictable in the future. This American election marks the beginning of a period of uncertainty. Certain positions taken by Donald Trump during the American campaign must be challenged. So is the United States going to completely alter the way it cooperates with the NATO alliance? The Donald is often described as completely unpredictable. But then again, so are world events. The first few months of the new administration have the potential to completely reset east-west relations. Many are nervous, but many are also hopeful. Caleb Maupin, RT, New York. There were chaotic scenes overnight around a refugee camp in Greece. Now, fireworks exploded as migrants reportedly faced off against far-right groups who had converged on that site. The disturbance ended with parts of the camp reportedly being set on fire. Four refugees needed hospital treatment, while around 50 were arrested, including two camp volunteers. Local sources there claim refugees were set upon by members of an anti-immigration gang 
who reportedly threw rocks at the camp's inhabitants. All right, more news in just a moment. The election of Donald Trump as the 45th president of the United States has left America's friends and foes in a state of shock as the world tries to process the new American reality could Trump's presidency prove to be just as groundbreaking as his campaign and election turned out to be. Some people say Trump is Biff from Back to the Future 2, and he's become the casino magnate that rules the world in a most hellacious, scandalous way. However, you could look at it as the second coming of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and the Founding Fathers, who are going to give the acid test of the Constitution to see whether an interested party can come in from the outside, run the country per the instructions as written in the Constitution, clean up, clean it all up, and then walk away. Good to have you with us today. Our security services in the UK look set to be handed the right to spy on citizens after the so-called Snoopers Charter made it through the House of Lords. The Investigatory Powers Bill effectively legalizes certain secret service activities. It will force internet service providers to store people's browsing history for 12 months. Now, while private messages can also be intercepted. The news has caused angry reaction on social media, with questions raised over the future of democracy, privacy and freedoms in the UK. Some even vowed to increase their browsing just to give the security services more work. And one ISP told us it's a major intrusion into people's lives. It's a bit scary, really. It's um, making us one of the sort of biggest police states in any democratic country around the world now. Uh, and it's not just the spy agencies like GCHQ that have all of these powers. It's like collecting details of every book you read. This is about collecting every website you visit. It's much more intrusive. And every bulk power in this bill is aimed at the majority of people who are not suspected of a crime. This is every website you visit recorded for every citizen in the country if they have their way. And, and the, the IP Act allows them to do that and collect that data and trawl through it without even a warrant. There's so much data, it's so vulnerable to attack, it's so valuable to criminals to collect all this, and it's so easy for criminals to get round this as well. It's just, it's, it's not a sensible approach. Police have used tear gas, rubber bullets and water cannons against thousands of public sector workers gathered outside government buildings in Rio de Janeiro. Soon after, around 60 demonstrators managed to force their way into the lower house of parliament. Protesters are angry about further austerity measures, including pension cuts, tax hikes and the scrapping of social programs. The authorities claim the moves are necessary to bring the country's financial crisis under control. Similar protests have become commonplace since the impeachment of former President Dilma Rousseff earlier this year. And we heard from a sociology professor who believes the polarization of society has significantly worsened following Rousseff's ousting. But you see, po social and political polarization has heightened since the parliamentary coup in May that brought Temer um, to power. We see very clearly what happened. Why did Tema take over and who was backing him? Well, Brazil is also an extremely corrupt country, and these also corrupt people are those that are now in power in government. And it was clear our post parliamentary coup analysis made it very clear that they overthrew Rousseff, and specifically so that the PT government and so that the judicial system would not investigate and prosecute these people that are not now in power. So a senior Trump advisor and former CIA director tells worlds apart how the new administration's policies might change. That'll be next on this network.